You are listening to Medicine and the Machine with Medscape Editor-in-Chief Eric Topol and Master Storyteller and Clinician Abraham Verghese as they talk with experts around the globe about the hottest topics in healthcare. This podcast is intended for U.S. healthcare professionals only. Hello, this is Eric Topol for Medicine and the Machine on Medscape, and I have been looking forward to having this conversation with Demis Hassabis for many, many months, if not years. I look at Demis as the leading force of artificial intelligence uh, in the world right now, actually, uh, it has been for some time. Let me just give you a little bit of background before we turn it over to him. Uh, he's a, he was a chess prodigy at age four, became a master in chess at age 13. He was admitted uh, at Cambridge at age 15, but uh, took a gap year to uh, do games, which you'll see was an important part later. Computer science at Cambridge, and then a uh, cognitive neuroscience PhD at uh, UCL. He started DeepMind in uh, 2010. Uh, now with about a thousand research scientists and engineers, I think about a thousand papers, almost one per research engineer and scientist, and notably the most nature and science papers of anyone in AI, any force. It's just extraordinary. His mission to solve intelligence, shoot for the stars, uh, not to be distracted with the practical stuff, generalized algorithms, relying a lot on reinforcement learning, human level intelligence across all cognitive tasks, not the narrow stuff. So Demis, I hope that's a reasonable summary. <laughs> Welcome. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Well, I wanted to get into three areas. Of course, the most important one that we, we converge is life science and where we may head in, in medicine. But first, I wanted to start with games because that was your first big foray, building on your, your uh, young age uh, endeavors that kind of reset games. Um, this was an interesting uh, direction. Uh, you call it a safe sandbox. Uh, you had... Uh, no, without being told, told the rules, the games uh, would, would move forward. And AlphaGo 2016 was a biggie with 10 to the 170th positions of this game Go. May, our Medscape audience may not know the game of Go, but it is ancient and it is uh, big. And I think there were some 200 million people watching uh, AlphaGo take on um, the world champion Lee Sedol, um and especially this Move 37. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Because that was historic. Yes. Well, look, I mean, games has been um, a huge part of my life since uh, I can remember. I mean, you you mentioned, uh, you know, I grew up playing chess, uh, captaining various England junior teams and things. And actually, it was chess that first brought me to uh, uh, my attention of like kind of how do we think? You know, I was sort of trying to improve at chess as a as a as a promising England chess junior. And of course, you're trying to improve your own decision making, your own thought processes, your own planning, uh, all these amazing things that chess teaches you and uh, you're trying to improve them. So then you start, at least for me, that started making me reflect about the nature of thinking itself. Uh, what was it? How are we coming up with moves? Uh, how are we coming up with plans and ideas? You know, what was doing that? The second part of that of games then um, became what my introduction to programming. So when I discovered computers, um, I taught myself how to program on a Sinclair Spectrum, which was huge in the UK in those days uh, when I was about eight years old. Um, and then, you know, I fell in love with computers as, a, as, a, as this incredible machine that um, even back then I could intuitively understand would be sort of almost like a potentially a magical extension of your mind um, if you could program in, in the right way. Um, and then, of course, my love of games and computers naturally combined into designing uh, video games, uh, which was my first career. Um, but even then, AI was a big part of that because the types of games I, I wrote professionally, probably the most famous was Theme Park when I was around 17 years old, sold you know, millions of copies. The, the, the cool innovation about that game was the AI that was part of it. So in Theme Park, you designed your own Disney World, basically, and then thousands of little people uh, came into your theme park and played on the rides and other things. And depending how happy they were, you could charge them more for their hamburgers and, you know, uh, their sweets and, and, and drinks in the stands. So the whole economics model underlying it. And for its time, this was in the early 90s, you know, uh, it was a revolutionary game. And what I realized why it was so popular was that every player 
had a different unique experience because the game's AI adapted to the way the player was playing the game. So no person's game would be the same as someone else's. So, um, so that sort of stuck with me. And, and, and around that age, I decided that my whole career was going to be about advancing AI. And um, it was also going to be the way I felt that we would make up, have a better understanding about our own minds. Um, and by you know building, trying to build artificial general intelligence, and then comp comp sort of comparing its capabilities to what we know about the human mind. Um, and of course, I took that further with my PhD, studying uh, the brain, specifically the hippocampus and memory and imagination. Um, and I studied that partly because I was fascinated about how the brain works, but also I wanted to get inspiration from the brain about algorithmic ideas, architecture ideas for AI. Um, so all of those things came together, as you say, in 2010, uh, uh, when we decided to start DeepMind. Um, and back in 2010, it's hard to remember now, uh, because AI is the most popular sort of buzzword there is. But in 2010, nobody was talking about AI, literally right. no one. And in, in, in investment world, you could, you know, we could barely get two, 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 two pennies together. And, uh, it was, you know, it's, it's sort of incredible to see what's happened in the last decade. Uh, and of course, at DeepMind, that was the third use, I would say, of games in my life, which is to use it as this training ground, this proving ground for AI systems, a really convenient uh, testbed. Uh, and that came to fruition with AlphaGo, as you said, beating the world champion at Go, which was a longstanding sort of Mount Everest problem in, in, in AI. And, uh, and we did it in this unique way of a learning system that learned how to play Go from first principles using reinforcement learning, playing against itself millions of times with no human knowledge programmed into it. And because of that, it was able to come up with its own original ideas, including this Move 37 that you mentioned, which was a sort of revolutionary idea in Go that even though we played as a species, we play Go humanities, you know, we invented it 3000 years ago. Um, so it's 3000 years of history, um, but no one had thought to play that type of move before in the history of Go. Yeah, that's amazing, actually. And then you went on, I just to close out the game portion here, which we could speak about for hours, of course, but of course, you, you moved through AlphaGo Zero and then to the most recent Moo Zero, uh, where you basically can cut across Go, Chess, Atari, Shoji. I mean, tell us a little bit about Mu Zero. Yeah, Mu Zero is the latest version of our Alpha Zero, you know, AlphaGo series. And um, what's unique about that is the, the AlphaGo programs and Alpha Zero programs, they play chess and Go. Uh, to you know better than world champion level and they played it from first principles so with no knowledge just through playing against itself and effectively forming its own idea about the motifs of the game but the thing about board games is even really complicated ones like chess and go is the rules are relatively simple and they're specified they're given to the program now in a computer game the transition uh, matrix, if you like, between different states. You know, if I make an action, what's the next? What's the next state of the world going to look like? Uh, it's much more unpredictable. You have to sort of model the pixels on the screen. There isn't a simple rules-based transition matrix. So what Mu Zero does, that's the big advance over the other programs, is it can learn the dynamics, let's call it, of the world it finds itself in, as well as then using that model to then improve itself um, through you know playing in that experiencing that world so um so that was so in theory you know so that the big breakthrough is then that could then combine our work on board games with our get with our work on computer games uh so things like atari which was our first big breakthrough playing uh classic atari games um you'll remember those from like space invaders pong all these kind of classic mm. atari games that was our first big breakthrough in 2014 2013 14 where our deep reinforcement learning system could master those games just from the pixels on the screen and being told to maximize the score. So not being told anything about the controls or the rules or how to get points, it would have to discover that all for itself from first principles. So that was the first big proof point, I think, at scale uh, in the whole AI uh, uh, industry of a, a learning system that could scale to something you know, impressive and challenging for humans, in that case, Atari games. So with MuZero, we've almost come full circle and built a system that can now play every game, you know, pretty much that we have ever tried, right? Uh, individually, we cracked. And then of course, we're off to generality, like you said at the beginning. So you can see that with the evolution of our programs, you know, AlphaGo, for example, only played Go, right? And it needed some human games to learn from, to begin with, to bootstrap itself. Then AlphaGo Zero removed the need for human games. So it just played against itself, starting from random. 
And then Alpha Zero, the, 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 the next version of that, that could play any two-player board game. Chess, Go, Shogi, anything you give it. Uh, and then Mu Zero, you know, now includes computer games. So you can see what we do is we try and get to, uh, you know, world champion level performance uh, with a system. And then we try and remove out of that system anything that might be specialized to that particular domain to make it more and more general. So it's a sort of technique if you look back on all of our last 10 years of work that we've been doing. Yeah, it's an extraordinary progression. And I do want to emphasize that when you started DeepMind in 2010, nobody talked about deep learning. And that didn't come about till mid uh, tens, you know, maybe 2015 or so. It, it was really prescient. And this game thing is such an extraordinary warm up for the big stuff that we're going to talk about in a minute. Before yes. I get into the protein structure story, which is just extraordinary, I did want to get a little bit of perspective from you on this category. I'll call it language, images, the tasks. Um, you have worked on uh, Alpha Code, Ithaca, Gopher, Gato. Yeah. Just give us a little flavor because these are things that are big. And of course, they are in parallel to the game work and to the life science work. And also with other entities out there that are trying to work in this space, like OpenAI with GPT 3 and 4 and uh, daily and so uh, you also have flamingo so just yeah. maybe give us your sense about that area yes well look it's obviously one of the most exciting huge growth areas right now um these large models so-called um they have different names sometimes foundational models so you know this is the exciting point where our systems you know deep learning specifically and as you say we bet on that very early in fact one of my one funny story was one of my investors many years afterwards said huh, did you name it DeepMind after deep learning? And I was like, <laughs> yes. Uh, you've only realized that now? Uh, anyway, but in 2010, of course, nobody knew what deep learning was. It had been invented in academia by Jeff Hinton and colleagues, and a few of the, those, uh, and a few of his colleagues actually now at DeepMind, but um, no one had heard of it in industry, of course, at that point. Um, but yes, so these things have now, people have figured out how to scale them to massive size, you know, with transformers, a new version of deep learning. Uh, so now they can be built with, you know, up to a trillion parameters and we're going to see things that with even bigger than that and uh you know they could with th things that size one can actually just almost read the entire internet right so uh and actually it turns out the internet we've been putting 20 years of you know 30 years now of you know billions of users have been putting tons you know unbelievable amounts of information on there and most of it's probably nonsense but there's a lot of you know there's a lot of facts on there if one knows how to, can in, if you can ingest it all. And so even though these systems are relatively inefficient, I would say if you certainly, if you compare them to the human brain, right? Like there's no way the brain is, you know, many, many orders of magnitude more efficient, data efficient. So that still is a challenge, but um, even still these brute force, you know, methods, large models are making huge progress. Um, and uh, initially on language understanding and language production, so text, but very rapidly, it's going to start becoming multimodal. We're seeing the beginnings of that with image and text. Um, of course, uh, we have our own versions of this that are state of the art and other uh, 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 companies also like OpenAI you mentioned also have theirs and, and Google too. So most of the big research companies and organizations now have their own state of the art uh, versions of these things. And the question is, of course, where, where do they go next? Because in my opinion, they still don't really understand what they're saying. So right. they're quite clever at regurgitating and averaging things together. And they can even, you know, they can sound very sensible for quite a, quite a you know, reasonably long conversation now. But um, they still don't really understand, I think, the, the nature of the world. They don't have models of the physics of the world um, or, 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 you know, theory of mind, things like that, other, you know, themselves and other. Um, so they're still, they're slightly strange um systems still uh, and there's a lot more to go now the question is whether continued scaling will be enough on its own or are there going to need to be some more big breakthroughs like alpha go wars or transformers or you know uh, how many more and this is a hotly topic uh, you know sort of debated topic um mm -hmm. and, and i think there's probably not many more but i think there's still some big innovations that are going to be needed uh, to get us to human level ai and you think that will happen though right of course, yeah, of course, I think eventually yeah. that will happen. And the reason is, is there's nothing, you know, studying neuroscience, there's nothing uh, seemingly non-computable in the brain, right? I've talked to people like Sir Roger Penrose, 
you know, many times about this. Obviously, he believes there's some quantum effect, but, yeah. but as far as neuroscientists go, you know, and you know this, I mean, no, nothing quantum or non-classical has been sort of proven to be going on in the brain. So if that's the case, then, you know, we are very sophisticated Turing machines. So are computers. <laughs> so there must be some way to, you know, in the limit to potentially mimic, you know, a lot of those capabilities, I would say. Yeah, that's extraordinary. Now, for the big area that I want to zoom in is, I call it, I think you've referred to it as well, digitizing or digitizing biology, yeah. protein structure. And I want to go back 50 years ago, Christian uh, Anfinson won the Nobel Prize in chemistry, and he said someday that you would be able to, to predict this, the, the 3D structure of, of proteins from the amino acid sequence, and then you did it. I mean, you, you just did it. And um, it's really, I, I think it's maybe the most important life science breakthrough uh, I can remember, certainly in decades. Um, and I think that is, maybe you could frame it. This, of course, started AlphaFold back in 2016. You have a team, I guess, about 20 people that work on this. It's amazing. So maybe you could tell us the story here, because uh, I'm just so blown away by it. Yeah, well, it's a, you know, it's definitely the most important, impactful thing we've done to date. And um, it's been, you know, it's been, it's probably been the, the most, the most difficult and hardest project we've done so far as well, and, and the most complex system we've produced too. So let me tell you a little bit about the history. So protein folding, which is, you, you know, um, uh, your, your, your listeners may know is, you know, is about understanding the 3d structure of proteins and proteins obviously underpin all of life everything every function in your body is 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 supported by proteins and their 3d structure sort of governs their function uh, in a large part um and you know so you start with this string of amino acid sequence string you know genetic sequence of the of the of the protein and you've got to it's almost like a puzzle you know what's the 3d output going to look like um and I, I've had my eye on this problem for a long time. As you said, it's a 50 year, it's, I, I think of it as Fermat's last theorem equivalent in biology, right? That's sort right. of this standing thing. And Christian Amphenson's a bit like Fermat, you know, he's like, oh yeah, as a throwaway comment in, in his Nobel lecture, it was like, oh, this should be possible. But, <laughs> um, you know, and, and he starts off a whole 50 year uh, <laughs> a, a field on it, right? But right, of course, right. he doesn't say how it should be done. He just says, you know, in theory, yeah, I'll just conjecture it's possible. And uh, I'm intrigued by those kinds of problems. And, and of course, as you mentioned, like the other reason, you know, we put so much effort into it and picked that one first is that, is that if it could be cracked, it should unlock, you know, whole new branches of, of life science research, which I think it's done, you know, already within, you know, less than a year. Um, and then the other things are, so I, I actually came across it, first of all, at college uh, as an undergrad in the 90s at Cambridge, because um, one of my, uh, you know, uh, acquaintances there in my close friendship group, he was obsessed with this problem. He still works on it at LMB. He's a structural biologist at LMB in Cambridge now. So he worked, his, he still, you know, continued to work on it for his whole career. And he, he, he used to talk about this at every opportunity, at least as how I remember it, you know, in the bars and other things. It's like, yeah, if we, you know, if we could solve protein folding, we better do X, Y, Z, and unlock everything, you know, drug discovery, all sorts. So of course, you know, that stuck in my mind. And I also, yeah, you know, I just think it's an intriguing problem. And I thought it would be well suited one day to AI, right? And, and of course, you know, I had this in the back of my mind, I have a little, I keep, I keep a little list of, you know, interesting problems I one day want to tackle. I've actually been so fun in the last couple of years is we've had amazing time, you know, in science and not just with AlphaFold, but applying AI to all sorts of interesting scientific problems. And, you know, we're ticking them all off one by one, but this was top of my list. And, um, and that's been the purpose of DeepMind all along, just to be clear, is that I set it up. Uh, of course, we play games and we proved ourselves on games. That was the most efficient uh, way to develop our algorithms. But we were always interested. It was, not, it was a means to an end, right? We were not interested in, in, in winning the games in of themselves. That was, although that was, those were great achievements in AI uh, and changed those, 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 those uh, worlds, like the Go world. But in the end, we were trying to use it to develop general algorithms that could then be translated to real world problems for huge impact. And that could be industrial problems, commercial uh, problems. Obviously, we've, we do a ton of stuff with Google and almost every Google product you use now um, has some deep mind technology in it. Um, but, but the real passion for me was applying it to massive scientific challenges. So to use AI to accelerate scientific discovery itself. Uh, and, and what's been so 
fun and gratifying, I suppose, in the last year or two is we finally got to the point where our systems are powerful enough and sophisticated enough that that can happen. And then AlphaFold is our first huge example of that, I would say. And we started that in 2016, the, the project itself, almost the day after we kept, got back from the, the match against Lisa Dole in Seoul. You know, we won that match 4-1. We did move 37. It was mind-blowing. You know, people are interested in that. It, there's a great uh, documentary, award-winning documentary done about it. It's on YouTube. It, you know, you can take a look on AlphaGo if you want to understand the, the, the human story behind that, which is also it really, it, you know, it, uh, interesting. But um, the moment I was already out there, once we'd won, we were 3-0 up, I was thinking, you know, what's next, right? And, and, and then I was thinking we were ready. We had the ingredients ready to go for uh, tackling a problem such as protein folding. And the final piece, which again is games, that came into it. So I first came across the problem in the uh, mid-90s. And then the second time I came across the problem was in my postdoc over at MIT in the late 2000s, 2009, just before I started DeepMind. And this game came out, citizen science game, you may remember it, Eric, called uh, Fold It. Oh, yeah. The Maker Lab, yeah. Right? Probably the biggest as, as, citizen science game there is, yeah. I think so. And I was intrigued. Of course, you can imagine when I was doing my PhDs in academia stuff, I was still intrigued by the idea of can you turn a game where gamers play, have fun playing a game, but they're actually doing useful science sort of accidentally, collaterally in the background. I mean, that would be amazing. And uh, I still think that idea has more to run, but... Even today, I still think Foldit's probably the best example of that. And, and for those of you not familiar with Foldit, it was it was like a puzzle game. It was turning the uh, it was almost like turning protein folding into a Tetris game, right? So you would make moves like bend the backbone of the protein, and then the, it would give you a score back, which was the energy function of the protein. And what was amazing, and I was watching this being played, is that it, a, a few really amazing gamers, although they weren't biologists, they actually solved the structure of a couple of pretty important proteins right. and they were published i think in nature and yeah. nature biology themselves so what i was thinking was when i then look back on this in 2016 when i was sort of ready to push this we were ready to press go on this was that well what have we done with um go we would mimicked the intuition of the go masters right and the go masters are incredible they play you know they that's all they've done is play go since they were <laughs> you know could could basically walk and um and it's obsessively done there in, you know, in Asia, in Korea, in China, in Japan, if you, you have the talent for it, you go to go school. And we managed to mimic and, uh, their intuition about the game of Go and with AlphaGo. So I was thinking, well, we should be able to, whatever it is that was going on in the gamers' minds with their pattern matching, right? Because they wouldn't be able to explain to you what they were doing, but somehow they were making the right decisions uh, in these two cases. We should be able to mimic that intuition uh, uh, in a system, an AI system as well. And uh, that was really the heart of the of the um, uh, the insight into why I do that project. Other cool things were there were some training data from the PDB, so existing experimental structures from the last thirty years, forty years of experimental uh, uh, biology had produced about one hundred fifty thousand structures, right? And so that was you know that's still relatively small for AI systems to train on, but it's enough probably to get going. Uh, and in the end, actually, to, in order to solve this, we had to get the system to produce its own predictions and then feed those predictions back in as new data because uh, uh, it wasn't quite enough actual data. So we can discuss that if that's of interest. But um, and so then so there's 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 enough data. And then the other important thing about problems we tend to pick is, is there a clear metric? that you can optimize against. And of course, in, in protein folding, uh, you know, it's the energy of the system. So it's very clear if you're making progress and, and, uh, and then the error rate of the positions of the molecules. So there's very you know, clear um, goals for, for, for hill climbing and making your system better. Uh, and then the final thing I should mention and give a call out to is, is the CAS competitions, which oh, is like the Olympics of protein folding. And the existence of that competition is really well run competition by John Moult and his colleagues. Um, and it's been going on for 30 years. And uh, that's a great benchmark to benchmark your systems against. Yeah, well, that cast, I mean, you know, that you you showed up after you've been sitting dormant without much improvement, and then you just kind of doubled it and doubled it again in terms of accuracy. Just for our, uh, our listeners, I mean, I think they need to know uh, this is uh, AlphaFold 2, which was uh, at the end of, well, published July 2021, uh, is at the level of ac atomic accuracy. 
less than one angstrom. Now, you know, I work with a lot of colleagues in structural biology. They spent years to determine the structure of a protein. And of course, many times they never even solved it. And not only do you produce confidence measures, but going back to fold it, you also, and any, any listener can just put in their favorite protein and see how it works in seconds. But you also get feedback, uh, like fold it, from the person, the user. And it's open source. And you, you linked up with the European uh, bioinformatics um, uh, entity, and it's free. And I think you have uh, every country in the world now, 500 thousand, maybe a million users, you've got, you're going from a million, this is like going from zero to 60 in less than one nanosecond, you're going from 1 million to 100 million proteins to every protein to any organism, model organism, every human protein. I mean, it's just mind blowing. And by the way, it was the breakthrough of the year of science last year, 2021, and of nature methods. I mean, wow. And yeah. you can also go on to predict RNA structure and gene expression, all these with the deep learning tools. And it has a lot of relevance in medicine, whether it's for neglected diseases, SARS-CoV-2 virus biology, antibiotic resistance, I mean, all these things. So this, what you're doing here is just shaking up the world of life science and medicine. You, yeah. you do realize that, right? <laughs> yes, it's been, you know, I do. And it's been incredible, actually, to see. Uh, I mean, we, we hoped it would have that kind of impact, but actually even, you know, there's no way we could have predicted it would be make this much of a of a, of a, of a sea change, actually. And uh, I've only started, you know, it's, it's hard for us sometimes to understand the full ramifications because obviously we're not exactly in that domain ourselves. There are a couple of people on the team that are, of course, when I mean, it's a hugely multidisciplinary team, by the way, it's not just machine learners and engineers. It's also biologists, biophysicists and chemists. You know, we couldn't, that's one of the things we specialize in at DeepMind is bringing together truly multidisciplinary research teams. And that's what was required to do something like AlphaFold. But yeah, since we've been giving talks at some of the biggest cathedrals, I would call them the molecular biology, you know, Emble and Tübingen and, 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 and the LMB in Cambridge and, and, you know, so on, and seeing biologists use it, it's a, it's a simple for them as using typing in, you know, in a Google search. It's a yeah, Google search for, yeah. for proteins. And, um, and of course, you know, we teamed up with the amazing European Bioinformatics Institute folks at, in Cambridge, uh, and they host a lot of the biggest databases already, like Uniprot. So they were the perfect partners for us uh, to host all of this data and, um, and, and do it super professionally. And just sort of, we realized if we did that rather than building our own tool, that would plug in directly into the main vein of uh, biology researchers. So they could just use it as another one of the standard tools they use, already are familiar with. Um, so that all worked out amazingly well and uh, has one of been one of our most fruitful collaborations. Um, but you're right, like, you know, effectively, we solved this problem sort of over the summer of 2020, right? During the CAS 14, it was, the results were announced at the end of 2020. Then we published, uh, you know, the methods and all the predictions of the yeah. human proteome and 20 other mortal organisms in the summer of, you know, 2021. So it's lightening speed for science, as you know oh, that, yeah. right? And, and then the thing is, is like, because it's a computational tool, it's amazing to see how fast it's been adopted in biologist workflow. Yeah. Because even if one invents a new amazing, you know, technique like CRISPR or optogenetics, or, you know, we've seen these in the past, it still takes, you know, maybe four or five years for that to, to really, um, people get trained in that new way of doing things and build their labs in the right way and, and figure out how to use them. But with a computational tool, it's just sort of instant. I mean, it's, it's sort of instant, first of all, to do it. So you make the breakthrough. So what was crazy was, you know, you make the breakthrough in summer of 2020, and then that Christmas, we just folded the whole human proteome, right? Uh, I mean, over Christmas, it was literally over Christmas while we we're having our Christmas lunch, we were sort of like running the computers. That's why another thing I love about computers is, you know, while you're having your Christmas lunch, they can be, it can be doing useful work for you, right? You come back, it's like, oh, solved it, great. So, um, and, and, and so we did that. And then, you know, then we thought, well, why not do another 20 motor organisms, all the important ones for research, you know, from, from the zebrafish, fruit, fruit fly, the mouse, uh, important ones for, for um, agriculture, like, you know, rice and wheat, uh, and then important ones for diseases, especially neglected diseases, you know, malaria. Um, and then more recently, we worked with the uh, uh, um, Drugs for Neglected Diseases Institute. Uh, and we, we ourselves, um, uh, um, sort of focused on, 
on doing things that were uh, uh, maximum beneficial for the world for like WHO and those things. So leishmaniasis, Chagas disease, all these sort of neglected diseases in the developing parts of the world that affect millions of people. But unfortunately, pharma uh, doesn't pay much attention to those things, right? So it's mostly nonprofits. So we thought if we could give them the protein structures, um, they can start drug development. Because of course, if you have the protein structure, that really helps with drug development because you now know what part of the protein to target. So this is the key reason why that's important in drug discovery. And as you mentioned, just as a finish on the numbers, you know, that's incredible. As you, as you said, it takes about, the, the rule of thumb used to be for an experimentalist to determine the structure of a protein, it takes one PhD student, their entire PhD, you know, yeah. five years to do one protein. And right. no guarantee it will work at the end. As you say, sometimes you still can't crystallize it. So, so, so we, 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 you know, in the whole history of, uh, experimental biology, uh, uh, we, we, you know, the community did 150,000, right, in total. And in the first year, we've done a million now, including the 20,000 for the human proteome. Um, and then, as you said, this exponential, because it's also software. So we're going to try and do, you know, the whole 100 million, all of the proteins known to science um, in over the next year. Yeah, no, it's just, I mean, if there wasn't attempting convincing about AI shaking up the world and the work you're doing, um, this is it. And by the way, this week, uh, it's the cover of science yet again with the nuclear pore complex uh, cracked, uh, your work and others uh, collaborating, and it's this sort of thing. And it's also re relevant to future pandemics with, you know, cracking the 20 top pathogens. And it just is extraordinary how much impact this has. Now, one of the areas that I know you're interested in, by the way, I mean, this is also, I'm sure gonna to lead to protein disorder prediction, yes, the yes. effects of point mutations, the functional aspect, not just the shape and 3D structure, but I know that's in the pipeline for you. Yes, uh, yes. But but what you did, you started, you know, the, this is another big outgrowth of all this is the drug discovery AI. Mm -hmm. And you started a company, Isomorphic Labs. Now here you open sourced everything you did. Yes. You enabled the entire, all these competitors. It must be like 50 companies now doing AI drug discovery. And you're also going to work on your own efforts. So help, help us understand that one. Yes. So, so as you mentioned with AlphaFold, you know, we decided that, 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 that the, the, the maximum impact we could have on, you know, for beneficial for humanity and for the scientific community was to open source that and, and, and make it freely available for any use, you know, commercial and academic. And I think quite a lot of people were surprised about that, even colleagues of, that I spoke to in pharma, you know, that, that we would allow pharma companies to use it. We just felt it was the best, it was the best way to do uh, that particular advance. And we've seen the consequences of that is how much flourishing has gone on since then. I didn't actually realize, I knew about the nuclear pore complex work, but I didn't realize it was out this week. So I will go and check that out. That's amazing, right? The biggest complex in the, oh. in the human body being <laughs> solved with, with AlphaFold helping. But it's, it's, it's I think, um, uh, I think there's just huge, this is just the beginning. You know, I, I, what you said earlier is, you know, I believe we're entering a new, a new era of digital biology. I think at its heart, biology can be thought of in a sort of fundamental way as an information processing system, right? That's sort of on a physics level what biology is. And, um, and DNA is the most obvious example of that, but I think all of biology can be viewed as sort of as informational. And if that's true, then I think AI could be the perfect uh, description language, if you like, for biology, you know, in the same way that maths is sort of perfectly describes physics. Right. And they're, they're the kind of um, they're, 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 they're sort of in partnership, I think, because uh, uh, biology is an information system, but it's an unbelievably complicated one and, and an emergent system. Right. I just don't think I think it's too complicated to describe with simple mathematical equations, for example. It's going to be right. much messier than that. Right. You're not going to have right. Newton's laws of motion equivalent for a cell. It's just too it's just too messy and too emergent, too dynamic. Yes. But mm -hmm. AI can potentially make sense of that soup of signals and patterns and structure, you know, and, and really complicated, far too complicated for the, for the human mind unaided. So I do, I do think we're in the sort of perfect regime. And I think AlphaFold is the first huge proof of concept of that, you know, that's something, otherwise it'd be just conjecture. But I do think it, you know, there are many more things like AlphaFold to come and uh, things like small molecule design, protein-protein interaction, point mutation prediction, or some of the things you've mentioned. Um, and isomorphic labs is our uh, attempt to, to push forward on the, specifically on the drug discovery angle. AlphaFold is mm -hmm. just one piece 
you know, the puzzle, right, to help drug discovery. But there are many other pieces of the drug discovery pipeline that I think AI can be fundamentally, you know, uh, speed up and improve, maybe improve the odds of, you know, uh, it going through clinical trials, uh, drug compounds. So I, I, I think this is, um, there's incredible, enormous potential for AI to reimagine or rethink the drug discovery process from, from first principles, but from an AI computational perspective. Yeah. Uh, uh, so that's what isomorphic is, is our, our expression and attempt to do that. I think it's terrific. And it's now getting to this intersection of life science and medicine, changing medicine. And that's where I wanted to get your perspective before we wrap up. So in medicine, uh, we have big problems. You would consider them narrow. Like, for example, uh, electronic health records have all this unstructured text and we can't deal with it really yet. Right. Uh, we also have this problem of multimodal AI, whereby you have people with sensors, with continuous data and the genome and a microbiome and, you know, their records and their environmental sensors and on and on and on, right? And we don't know how to analyze that data. How, how are we going to move this field forward where we actually can understand the individuality, the uniqueness of each person? Yeah, I, I, I agree with that. And we, we've done our own work in the past on, on image scans, recognition, uh, mammography. Uh, actually, we published some big papers in Nature on that and, and retinal scans with more fields uh, in the UK one of the best eye hospitals. Um, and I think all of imaging now can be helped, you know, it's sort of almost routine for AI to be able to help process that. So at least triage, you know, the scans for the doctors, right? And, mm -hmm. and the nurses mm -hmm. to then decide what are the, what are the uh, critical, uh, you know, or difficult cases. Um, so that seems to be a no brainer to me. And then as you say, somehow it's gotta be collected uh, multimodally with electronic health records and, and text and other things. And there's a question, of course, all while respecting privacy, obviously, which is vitally important in this area. So I think there's a lot, and, and, and the problem I think there is, is in a lot of the health um, systems in the world, uh, uh, the, the data is in very archaic systems, not very well uh, uh, curated. So it's actually quite hard for, for anyone to find or even combine the right source of data together. So I think that's a question maybe for, you know, uh, politicians and, 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 and um, you know, health ministers to sort of figure out how they want to do that. Um, I think there are some countries maybe like Singapore or places like that that um, are more integrated where that's, you know, maybe they're smaller countries. So it's a bit simpler. Um, perhaps it's going to develop in those places first. Um, but then when it comes to personalized medicine, which I, I think is a kind of buzzword and has been for a while, but I don't think has been realized yet, is, is of course medicine should be personalized in the sense of let, let's take cancer therapies or other things. I think it's well understood now or well appreciated now that cancers are actually a multitude of diseases, right? And in fact, it can be, there can be very individual cancers if you sequence the cancer itself and individual how it interacts with the, 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 the patient. Right, in an individual way. Same with the microbiome, all sorts of things that we're understanding. The very comp microbiome, probably super important in many diseases, but we don't very poorly understood and very unique to each individual. And so I think if we really want to have personalized medicine, where instead of like sledgehammering these, these cure, you know, these cures, like you, you give people a whole cocktail of drugs because you know, you're not sure which one's going to work specifically with that patient. And then you obviously do damage to their systems as well as perhaps hopefully curing them, but you also do a lot of collateral damage. And, and I think that can be made much more precise if one was to understand the individual involved. But the problem then is you've got to extrapolate from an N of one and current medical techniques are, you know, you need ends of hundreds or thousands yes. to be sure, right? Yes. And, and also from an expense point of view, if you imagine like we have like a generic drug and it works on most people, um, but then I could imagine a world where, uh, you know, 10 years from now with some AI systems, perhaps with isomorphic is we go in, we, we genetically uh, uh, find out your details and other things and you get tested. And then the AI just tweaks that generic drug slightly for you. Right. But and we know and then it can predict what the outcome of that will be and it will have less side effects and all of these things and be more eff effective. And that seems to me um, maybe the only way, you know, that seems like a plausible way personalized medicine can really come to life. And of course, that would be amazing for healthcare. Um, well, and then, yeah. I, I get your perspective on this idea of a digital twin infrastructure, whereby today, as you know, 
we do these clinical trials and maybe 10 out of 100 benefit and we treat all the other 90 with the same cockamamie thing, it won't even help them. We don't even know, we're so stupid, right? But what if you had a planetary digital twin infrastructure that you could get nearest neighbors at every level, you know, at all the yeah. depth. And you could say precisely, you will respond, you know, this is the best treatment and the best outcome or the best prevention. Is that attainable? I mean, you're you're very young. I mean, you're you're just a young puppy. You're only like what 45 or something. Could we ever get to that in, in your lifetime, you think? I, I I hope so. I mean, I think um one of the things that we're gonna try and do with isomorphic, but also at DeepMind, you know, with our science team that we're also doubling down investments on uh is you can think of it as building up the interaction layer. So, so you know, with modeling more and more complex parts of biology, right? So you talk about a digital twin. One of my dreams is in the next 10 years, can we produce a virtual cell? Yeah. So, so yeah. a cell where, and what I mean by a virtual cell is you model the whole function of the cell, right? With an AI system. And you could do virtual experiments on that cell. And the predictions that come out of that would hold when you checked it in the wet lab. Can you imagine if you had something like that, how much faster and more efficient that would make the whole drug discovery and clinical trial process instead of, yes. you know, it's crazy that, as you said, only one in 10 uh, drug candidates makes it through the trials, right? And, and, and it takes 10 years to even get to that point. <laughs> yeah, right? yeah. So it's billions of dollars. That's why we don't have more drugs for more, more diseases, especially in the, in the poorer parts of the world. Is this just the, 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 the risk? The, you know, the, the, the investment risk is just so huge and it's too slow for the, giving the aging population and the things we know we have to deal with future pandemics and other things. So I think we, you know, AI, so you can think of what we've done with AlphaFold again is the first step of the, of the ladder, which is, okay, can we determine the structure of proteins, but statically, right? But of course, biology is a dynamic system. So that's the next step is proteins interacting with other proteins and, 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 and maybe disordered areas then get order because of that. Uh, proteins interacting with ligands and molecules um, and then you build up slowly maybe pathways and then eventually to cells and then ultimately perhaps the whole organism right that would, so, that so that's be... that's the dream well i i hope you'll add that to your checklist uh Demis. now i i have to say i've been enthralled by this discussion uh you're an amazing force you and your team there i uh i can't thank you enough for taking your time with us and i want to congratulate you because you have You've really shaken up life science. Like I don't know anyone else that has done this. Um, it's 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 really extraordinary. And you're and you're just getting going. I mean, this is fresh stuff that just came out. You know, in recent times. And you know where where you're headed. I we will follow you. Uh, everyone listening should realize we're we're talking to a force now. The only thing you have to do is convince us that you're actually human and not an AI agent. But <laughs> outside of that, I mean, yes. wow, wow. Well, thank you, thank you. It's very kind of you to say, so, Eric, and it's been really, you know, really appreciate the uh, the conversation. I really enjoyed it. And uh, yes, you know, of course, this has all got to be. And I think of this as well a lot in, in my spare time of um, my small amount of spare time of you know reading philosophy and humanities and other things. We have to, you know, we talked about science today only. But we have to put that in context of the human spirit and and creativity and all of these other things that I also think a lot about. And, you know, perhaps we could have a separate discussion about that one day. Yeah, but it's, that uh, would be fun. You know, I think a lot about that, too. And of course, that's key to to everything that we do. Well, one of the human qualities I was in touch with, I think you're a big sports enthusiast, yes. too, right? I am. So yes. there are some things about you that are very much uh, that people can identify with. But yes, exactly. Yeah. If there ever was one of a kind, I think Dennis, you qualify uh, in the highest le level. So thank you. Uh, I know our Medscape um, group will really enjoy this discussion and we'll come back for more in the times ahead. Thanks very much. Thanks for having me.